Atihe Māori ora, e ngā mana, e ngā reo rauranga tira mā, a tēnā koutou katoa. Tēnei te minu i kia koutou, nau mai, hara mai, uh, ki tō tātou hui o tēnei rā. A very warm welcome to you all to this outreach seminar uh, focused on the recently concluded FTA between New Zealand and the United Kingdom. I know there are a lot of people online today, and it's great to have you all with us. A special welcome uh, to the Minister for Trade and Export Growth, uh, the Honourable Damien O'Connor, whom I will introduce in just a moment. Uh, tēnā koe e te minita. Uh, my name is Stephen Jacoby. Uh, I serve as Executive Director of the New Zealand International Business Forum. And I know that, uh, like me, you will be grateful to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and to our colleagues there, uh, for organizing uh, today's webinar to expand our knowledge and understanding of this latest uh, trade agreement for Aotearoa New Zealand. Uh, this FTA has been described uh, as historic, and I believe it is historic uh, for several reasons. Firstly, it delivers unprecedented market access for New Zealand in the UK, and for the UK in New Zealand, especially for services and investment. It puts in place a new and in many cases, innovative set of rules uh, for trade and investment, including in areas like digital trade, sustainability and inclusiveness, uh, particularly for Maori, women and small and medium sized enterprises. And it sets up the UK very well to join the comprehensive and progressive uh, agreement on Trans-Pacific Partnership, and so to become a valuable new trade ally for New Zealand uh, globally. Today's webinar allows us to explore this in a little more detail. Uh, our further sessions will be organized uh, subsequently to go even further into the detail of this agreement but we're starting this process today. And we've allowed plenty of time for questions, but if we don't get through them all, then I, the MFAT team tells me that they will endeavor to answer them afterwards and to get those answers out to us. And as well as the minister who will speak to us in a moment, we do have a panel of knowledgeable experts from both business and government who will also give their perspectives and answer your questions. And I'll introduce that team to you a little later on. <clears throat> First, however, I am delighted that our globe-trotting trade minister, Damien O'Connor, can join us. Uh, minister O'Connor hails uh, from the west coast of the South Island. Uh, he serves uh, also as Minister of Agriculture, and he walks the talk as a dairy farmer and a well-known advocate of sustainable farming practices. Minister O'Connor has just returned from a tour of European and Middle Eastern capitals. And this time, thank goodness, Minister, you didn't have to go into MIQ uh, at the end. Uh, that was a plus. Uh, but while in London on the 28th of February, uh, the Minister signed the NZ UK Free Trade Agreement with his colleague, the Right Honourable Anne-Marie Trevelyan, Secretary of State for International Trade. Uh, and it's that landmark moment that we're going to talk about today. So Minister, welcome, no my haramai, uh, the floor, or rather the screen is all yours. Uh, ina manu, ina reo, uh, rangatira ma, uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, well, look, welcome one and all uh, to the opening public engagement uh, event on the New Zealand-UK Free Trade Agreement. And I'd particularly like to acknowledge Your Excellency uh, Laura Clark. I understand you're on uh, the screen here. You, the UK's High Commissioner to New Zealand and our Race Relations Commissioner, Commissioner uh, Meng Foon. Uh, welcome and, and thanks, Stephen, for those kind words of introduction. Um, as you all know, I, I did recently return from travel to the UK, uh, Belgium, Switzerland, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. Um, this travel 
has marked a clear stepping up of New Zealand's trade agenda in 2022 uh, to advance New Zealand's trade and economic interest with our key partners. And my travels were a first step uh, to let our trading partners around the world know that New Zealand is reopening up to the world um, as our Reconnecting New Zealand program uh, proceeds in 2022. Uh, it was great to be able to say that our businesses are resuming travel uh, to strengthen their relationships with customers, partners uh, and markets around the world um, after a couple of tough years. I'd like to uh, focus my remarks today on the UK leg of the trip. Um, the purpose um, was, of course, to visit the UK and strengthen our bilateral trade relationships, which, of course, importantly included the signing uh, of our New Zealand-UK free trade agreement. Signing the FTA was a major highlight of the trip and nailed down one of the highest quality and most ambitious free trade agreements that Aotearoa Royal New Zealand has ever signed. Uh, it serves as a historic moment in one of our closest and most important relationships. Once in force, uh, the FTA will provide New Zealand with access to the UK's $3 trillion consumer market of over 67 million people. Access that we haven't had easy access to uh, since the UK entered the European communities in 1973. Uh, the benefits in New Zealand have been estimated, uh, and I'm sure there may be questions on that, at a, between $700 million and $1 billion. I'd just like to highlight a couple of areas. Um, the market access package is one of the very best that New Zealand has secured in an FTA, with elimination of all tariffs over time. The tariff savings for our exports to the UK would amount uh, to about $37 million uh, at current trade levels, and almost all of these gains will be felt from day one uh, by exporters. At entry into force, 99.5% of New Zealand's current trade will enter the UK duty-free. This includes products like wine, honey, onions, kiwi fruit, uh, and many dairy products. The FTA also secures access for services exporters and investors on par with the UK's best FTAs. This provides certainty, of course, for our service exporters and investors, uh, something that is really important if you're planning ahead. The government had a number of key objectives in concluding a high quality FTA. One of those was ensuring that all New Zealanders can benefit from trade, including Māori. The FTA gives special recognition of the unique relationship between Māori and the British Crown as the original signatories of Tatariti o Waitangi. It also includes a dedicated Māori trade and economic cooperation chapter, uh, the second of its kind that New Zealand has negotiated to date to advance Māori trade and economic interests. More broadly, the FTA delivers significant outcomes for Māori. Close engagement between negotiators and Māori highlighted substantial Māori interest in the full and complete opening of market access for New Zealand's primary sector exports into that UK market. This FTA is also notable, notable uh, as being the first FTA negotiated and signed under our government's Trade for All agenda. It contains commitments on trade that are sustainable, inclusive, and reach many New Zealand communities. It includes outcomes in areas such as trade and labour, a chapter on trade and development, and new chapters on trade and gender equality to support women's economic empowerment and on consumer protection. In this way, the FTA helps to set benchmarks to support the success and sustainability of New Zealand's trade policy in the longer term. But like all trade deals, um, this FTA does not end at signature. Uh, the government is determined to promote effective implementation and continued meaningful engagement uh, to maximise the benefits of this agreement. Um, today's event um, is an opportunity to commence that discussion, and you will hear from a range of perspectives whose voices are wholly relevant uh, to the outcomes of this agreement. Uh, further opportunities for engagement include a session uh, with my friend and colleague, uh, Under Secretary Reno Terakatni, uh, and sessions with negotiators and officials from a range of New Zealand government agencies uh, focusing on specific themes. I'm sure you'll find those very useful. 
Right, that's uh, enough from me. And, and I think it's time uh, to hear from you on questions relating to the FTA. Um, I, I don't uh, confess to have read it or uh, 1,400 or so pages of it in the last couple of weeks. But um, if there are any technical details, I'm sure we can refer them on and, and get um, some accurate answers for you. But more than happy to take your questions. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora, Minister. Thank you very much um, for that brief overview. Uh, and um, let, let me just ask a question, if I may, uh, to get us started. And I just want to remind uh, those watching that they can put their questions uh, in through the Q&A function. Uh, uh, on their screen. But Minister, um, you, you talked a bit about the economic impact that this might uh, agreement might be able to have, but um, why do you think that this FTA is particularly important for New Zealand at this particular time? Um, look, before COVID, we saw some protectionism kind of creeping in, um, some nationalism, some uh, a view, I guess, that trade was the problem and creating some inequalities. Uh, in, in many of our trading partners and across the globe. And so there was a move to kind of shut down the borders. Uh, COVID, of course, exacerbated that. Um, but what we saw, um, of course, through the, the production, or firstly, the creation, the production, and the distribution of, of COVID vaccines is that we rely on trade. We need to be able to move the products, the components, of the vaccine uh, into a place for production and then shift it around the world. So, so I guess at a time of, of protectionist inclination, actually the value of trade is even more important. And I think us being able to sign a high quality trade deal like this actually sets a benchmark uh, for the rest of the world and says that in, in collaborating with one another, having interdependence in, in, in crucial areas where we have no expertise ourselves, is actually the best way forward to solve many of the world's challenges. Well, I, I, I can only agree, Minister, that you're right, that these are not uh, easy times, are they, for um, exporters and for business people generally, indeed, uh, the world as a whole. So this is a very welcome step. Look, we've had a question from, um, um, uh, from one of our uh, viewers asking for an update on the ratification process. When will the agreement be ratified, or when do you think it'll, uh, it will be ratified? Well, I always say as soon as possible, but clearly there's parliamentary processes in both the UK um, and in New Zealand, and that, and that process is underway. The select committees having a look at the agreement, uh, listening to submissions on it, uh, and then there'll be a process through Parliament uh, of legislation. Uh, we hope that we can have this ratified by the end of the year, and that, that moving into uh, 2023, which will be 50 years exactly, of course, um, from the time that the UK, um, you know, went with the EU, uh, that we will start to fully engage back into this market. Um, Minister, are there some uh, elements of this FTA that are particularly important to you personally? That you are particularly pleased about? I mean, you're pleased about everything, right? But I, I am. And, and, you know, I have to say, look, I've got to say here, the, the negotiating team and the teams at NFAT um, are, are outstanding. Um, we're tucked down here in the bottom of the Pacific, um, often out of the time zone that's suitable for other people. And, and normally we would have engaged on a person to person basis. Uh, that wasn't possible. So actually, most of this trade deal was negotiated by, via Zoom. We had a, some good people up in the UK as well. Um, but Brad Burgess and the team here in, in Wellington, all of those people deserve congratulations. Look, in summary, um, I don't think anyone would have believed that we could end up with zero tariffs on, uh, on our primary exports into that market. You know, the, the farmers in the UK and through the EU think that we are a huge producer, that we can flood their market. That's not the reality. So we've, we've got to a position now where I think we can provide good uh, off-season product into their market, um, sustain that, work with them to get good value for everyone. So uh, I, I'm happy uh, for, for the farmers, but also the other areas of, of trade and sustainability where, you know, the world's moved on and we have to focus on, on these other areas of importance important services and goods in the environmental space in particular. Uh, well, um, you, you, you just referred to um, agricultural um, matters, agricultural practices. Um, we've got a question here about the animal welfare clause. Um, what is the purpose of that clause? Uh, and is it expected to be able to enforce certain behaviours in either UK or in, in New Zealand? 
Look, early on, the UK indicated that it wanted um, an animal welfare chapter in here. Um, I had discussions. We run different farming systems in our country and their country, and, and it's not for us to make judgments on, you know, what are house operations and what the appropriate animal welfare standards, neither for them to make judgment on our pastoral system. So we kind of agreed that as long as we committed to the highest standards of our farming system, which is what the chapter does, and as long as we don't undermine those standards for trade advantage, which is exactly what the chapter says, then, then we will carry on with our own systems, use expert advice and, and claim to be, and I think it's, it's true, to have some of the best animal welfare standards in the world. Um, so so it, look, it's, it's part of consumer awareness um, and their concerns both in the UK and the EU. So we have to be mindful of that as we move forward. Thank you for that, for that, Minister. I mean, um, I suppose it's also uh, the case, is it, that um, the uh, agreement sets up generally uh, procedures and frameworks for us to be able to continue to discuss with British counterparts, uh, not just animal welfare issues, but a whole range of other things that are of, of relevance to us both. Look, it, it does, and the movement of, of services and, and um, you know, professionals in and out of our country, it, it, it doesn't lock it in. It leaves the door open for ongoing evolution because, uh, one thing we do know now that is we not only disruption uh, that is a, is a regular challenge for us, but but change. Um, and um, so we we the digital trade area obviously a new and emerging area uh, where we have to ensure that we we protect people's privacy, their data, um, but we enable um, you know companies in New Zealand that are innovative moving into the UK market. They still want to be able to maintain a base here um, and operate properly uh, in that market. So these are the new areas of trade agreements that weren't necessarily on the table even 10 years ago, let alone 30 or 40 years ago. So, uh, so it is a progressive agreement and it leaves the door open for that ongoing engagement. Uh, continuing on the topic of um, uh, animal products, um, uh, the, the agreement encompasses uh, the range of products uh, which are included, right? Uh, not just our particular favorite meat and dairy, but a whole range of different products. Uh, look, it does, and, and things around uh, standards, um, ensuring that actually we make progress on, on AMR, uh, antimicrobial resistance, um, committing there to, to ensure that we've, we work together in these areas uh, to have the highest standards of food safety, um, and, and even leaving the door open while it doesn't refer directly to, I guess, the new uh, plant-based uh, products, but um, th those are new areas in trade that, um, again, will we want to work with like-minded partners like the UK and we hope eventually the U EU um, to ensure that we protect our consumers, we provide opportunities for the producers um, and we continue to come up with creative new products. And uh, probably 15 years ago, Manuka honey was not of the same value into that market it is today. And probably people didn't think of protecting uh, access for it. And, and of course, you know, uh, the, maintain the maintenance of the high standards that uh, we want for Manuka honey and everything else we eat. Yes, thank you. And, and, and uh, on, on that topic of Manuka honey, which is of particular interest to uh, a number of exporters, but particularly Maori exporters, can we talk a bit about the Maori trade and economic cooperation elements in this agreement? Um, uh, you know, there is, this agreement is groundbreaking in that regard. Who will be responsible for implementing this? Uh, and um, how can Maori be encouraged to take up the opportunities uh, that exist in this agreement? Well, I think um, Māori play a, a big part in the primary sectors and are huge exporters already, um, and they'll, they'll get increased opportunities through uh, goods access uh, agreement. But, but there was um, a request and expectations under our trade for all policy that um, an agreement signed quite some time ago called the Treaty of Waitangi um, that, that, that would be acknowledged in this trade agreement. And indeed, we had to have some reasonably uh, hard discussions with the UK. They didn't initially think of it of being of relevance. Um, it's a historical agreement. They wanted to move forward. Um, but we, we nonetheless got this chapter into the agreement, acknowledging the history, then, then committing to build opportunities for Māori through this trade agreement. So, um, you know, we, we haven't limited those opportunities. We've acknowledged uh, that, and, you know, in some areas like the Haka, we've, we've come up with a side there that, that you know, protects 
the rights um, and acknowledges the source of the haka. And those things are really important. But there's a whole lot of other cultural issues along with uh, the basic trade in goods where Māori will have increased opportunity and recognition. Uh, thank you, Minister. Can I ask you about the trade and gender chapter? Uh, because uh, that also is part of the trade for all agenda and this inclusiveness uh, approach that, that we're trying to take. Would you like to offer some comments on that one? Look, it's just it's a commitment uh, by both parties um, to ensure that uh, through trade uh, and everything we do in this area, we work to enhance opportunities for for women. And, and I think we're two countries that are probably relatively lucky, but we, we committed to this on the basis that it sets a standard and example for the rest of the world. And there'll be other trading nations that perhaps don't have or haven't provided the same opportunities for one. Um, this, this again is is, is at, the, at the leading edge of that progress. So trade and gender is part of our, our overall trade strategy. And we have those discussions with many of our trading partners um, and are part of um, you know, an open plurilateral agreement um, called ITAG, which will um, inclusive trade and agenda uh, agreement that, that actually wants to in, in, well implement these chapters and these agreements uh, across the globe. Mm. Turning also to people to people elements in this agreement, we have a question about um, uh, people movements, uh, and it is that the, uh, the UK-Australia trade agreement included provisions for greater visa access uh, for Australians and Britons to live and work in each other's countries. Um, uh, can New Zealand also confirm that greater visa access for New Zealand, British, New Zealand and British citizens will be discussed in due course following the conclusion or ratification of this agreement. I can assure you it is being discussed. Um, it, it wasn't that uh, the UK did not want it as part of the free trade agreement, um, but they were committed uh, to progress this discussion. And so I can assure you that we, we are optimistic um, that, and we would like to think we could get um, similar to Australia. Um, their process, process was slightly different. Uh, the UK uh, in the second round of this discussion said, look, we don't want it as part of the FTA, but we will continue with those discussions. And we hope there's an outcome from these ongoing discussions in the near future. Uh, still getting quite a few questions here, but I think our time is uh, with you, Minister, at least is, is running out. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, on behalf of one of our uh, of viewers, um, are there any provisions in the agreement to promote joint research, technology transfer and innovation? Yes, all of those areas. And I guess if, if you look at trade and sustainability, the environmental chapter, um, that, that's the very areas where we can make huge progress. Acknowledging the, um, the professional standards um, is, is an, something that we have included in the trade agreement. Um, so we, whether they be scientists or be they lawyers, um, we've, we've you know, committed to acknowledge those standards and those qualifications, which will allow the transfer of individuals along, of course, with the knowledge. And while there'll be some intellectual property protections um, in our countries, you know, we'll, we'll be sharing that knowledge. And I guess the one thing we have discussed with all trade ministers is that, um, you know, COVID has been a big challenge of, of the present. We have um, climate change as the next big challenge for us and then food security. And it will be through the transfer of intellectual property, the sharing of that, the transfer of knowledge and goods and services uh, that we will collectively be able to tackle and hopefully beat those challenges and provide a, a more secure world. And, uh, you know, trade is the way to provide the solutions. Uh, a, a trade may be seen by some as the problem, um, but indeed, if we didn't have it, we'd all be uh, far poorer as both a nation and, and as a, a planet. So uh, this is a good standard. I want to once again thank all the people who have been involved in the negotiation of this and all those stakeholders who had input um, back into MFAT through the process. Thank you very, very much. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. Kia ora. Well, thank you, Minister. I really appreciate your time uh, coming along today and answering uh, our questions. And um, there are one or two others popping up, but our MFAT team will be in, with, in touch with uh, the uh, questioners to be able to answer them. Um, I think we also need to thank you, Minister, for all the work that you personally have done to get this uh, FTA across the line. One of the uh, more speedily negotiated and concluded uh, trade agreements that we have seen. Um, what can we say? Now bring on the next one, Minister. Um, plenty of things for you to, uh, to work on and to keep you busy. Uh, I wish you all the best and thank you again.
Well, uh, look, we are moving rapidly through our agenda today, uh, and uh, the Minister has given us a very good basis uh, to be able to continue our discussion uh, with our panel, who we have with us. And I'm really delighted uh, at the, um, uh, the caliber of people uh, that have been brought together today. And let me introduce them uh, to you. Uh, first of all, can I introduce um, Her Excellency Laura Clark, who has been since uh, 2018, uh, the UK's High Commissioner to New Zealand. Uh, um, High Commissioner Clark, Laura, if I may, you have been indefatigable in going up and down the country, um, talking uh, to people, engaging with audiences uh, about um, opportunities arising um, from this FTA. Uh, and um, uh, that has paid back in the agreement that we now see uh, before you. So um, what I might do is I might introduce all of our panelists and then we will kick off in the order in which uh, people are uh, introduced. Uh, so we also have with us today, Liz Mellish. Liz Mellish, uh, who I'm sure is going to be on screen now, if that's right. Uh, Liz Mellish, uh, who has had um, a quite extraordinary business career uh, spanning um, 40 years or more around several different sectors. Uh, Liz today is the chair of Te Farewaka o Poneke, and she is deputy chair of the Federation of Maori Authorities, uh, and is very well placed to comment on aspects of this agreement. It is very fitting to have you here, given the importance of this agreement uh, for Maori and for uh, Maori business development uh, uh, in the future. Uh, we also have with us uh, Philip Gregan. Uh, Philip is the Chief Executive Officer of New Zealand Wine Growers, the industry uh, body uh, for wine, of course. Wine, our largest export uh, to the United Kingdom. Uh, I may say also that uh, Philip is the Chair of the New Zealand International Business Forum and therefore is my boss. So um, we will be extremely uh, complimentary to his presentation uh, today, of course. Uh, but great to have you with us, uh, Philip. Uh, can I also introduce Nick Swallow, uh, who's beaming in uh, from London. Nick Swallow is New Zealand Trade and Enterprises, hardworking trade commissioner in London. Uh, and he is at the coalface of making this new agreement work uh, for New Zealand exporters and New Zealand business. So, te um, nou mai haramai ki kahui. Look, let's kick off, as I said, with each of you in turn, starting with High Commissioner Laura Clark. Kia ora. Kia ora, uh, Stephen. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, ka nui te mi ki a koutou katoa, ke te harekoa hau kua tai mai ki tēnei hui. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, a warm welcome back to the Minister after his travels and greetings to all my uh, fellow panellists. Um, it is an exciting time that we've got this um, FTA to signature and it is no mean feat actually if you consider, as, as the Minister said and as you've said Stephen, that we did this all in the context of a global pandemic, we couldn't really do much in the way of face-to-face -face negotiations and also in the face of significant disruption to the global economy. So it does feel like a bright spot. Um, and I feel at the moment it feels as though, you know, the world is starting to move on from all the restrictions imposed by COVID and the world is starting to open up, um, which is all for the good. But at the same time, of course, we have got the, the most dangerous time, I would say, in, in recent memory in terms of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, war on the continent of Europe, so an incredible violation of Ukraine's sovereignty, you know, you know, war crimes being committed there, mass human rights abuses. It is a really terrifying time and it has implications not just, of course, for European security, but for the world as a whole, because it is a real threat to the rules-based international system on which we all depend for the, for the proper operation of trade, for the protection of small countries so that we do not have a world where might is right. So it's a dangerous time. And, you know, the UK and New Zealand and 
all our international partners have been really united in, in condemning Russia's aggression and also providing support uh, for Ukraine and its people. And I think, you know, in a way I, I mentioned that partly because it's just, it's hard not to mention it, but also because it underlines more than ever the importance of these connections in terms of and our cooperation on trade and economic prosperity and the connections that we forge through um, free trade agreements like this that, that underpin both um, our economies, but also the shared values and the people links between our countries. Um, and it is, you know, it is an FTA, I think, to be proud of. Prime Minister Ardern has referred to it as a, as a gold standard free trade agreement. That was what we set out to do. We set out to make it a really innovative, high ambition free trade agreement that would set the tone for trade agreements to come. And I think we've done that. You know, we've done it in terms of far reaching um, tariff liberalization. So you're really opening up uh, trade and goods. So yes, um, great for the UK consumers of New Zealand wine and dairy and meat, but also great for all those in New Zealand who want British clothing and gin and um, tractors and, and heaven knows what. So, so that's really good on goods, but it's also very exciting on services, very far reaching provisions on services, as you mentioned, Stephen, you know, we're excited about the pathway towards mutual recognition of qualifications, uh, the increased investment screening thresholds, greater business mobility, all of that, which is so important because of course, 80% of the UK's exports are in the services area and the really innovative um, provisions on digital trade, which, you know, we hope future proof this free trade agreement to account for the changes that we, we can't yet um, imagine in the future. And I think then, you know, I think some of the things that we're, we're most pleased of in, on the innovation side is the, is the um, ambitious provisions on the environment and trade and reinforcing our joint commitments to the Paris Agreement. Uh, you've mentioned um, Stephen and the minister mentioned gender and trade and of course a labor of course the labor standards affirmed in the free trade agreement are very important as well um, and one that's particularly close to my heart is that um, is the Maori trade and economic cooperation chapter really I think uh, reflecting the importance of that historic relationship between the UK and Maori and that shared ambition to build the cooperation going forward to make sure that businesses on both sides of the world can really take advantage advantage of those opportunities and strengthen the connections between our, our countries. And of course, you're not done when you've got the free trade agreement. We've got to make sure um, that, of course, first it's ratified, but then it's actually used properly. And so I think we've all got collectively, the New Zealand government, the British government, businesses, um, everyone has got a big off, um, job in hand to raise awareness of it and make sure that these opportunities are taken advantage of. So I think that's the next the piece of work for the for the coming month. Um, but it is, it is an exciting time. I feel like the FTA sets the foundation. It's a new chapter really in the UK-New Zealand relationship. It paves the way. Um, we hope for our, the UK's accession to the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, and I think, again, just to, ref, you know, to come back to the dangerous times in which we live, it shows what two liberal outward-looking countries can achieve as, you know, in trade, but in also laying the foundations for stronger cooperation on the issues that matter most to us. And in support of the rules-based multilateral trading system on which we all uh, depend. And as we're all grappling with the consequences of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I think that cooperation between like-minded, close partners like the UK and New Zealand is more important than ever. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Kia ora. Kia ora, kia ora, Laura. Thank you very much uh, for your remarks. Uh, let's go now to Liz Mellish. Uh, who uh, will also speak to us uh, from her perspective about the agreement. Akia koe te rangatira. Oh, kia ora, Stephen. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa e na haifa. Kua tai mai nei ki tēnei hui. Uh, welcome, everybody across the globe to our hui, um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, on how exciting it is for us for the first time ever not just to have the treaty uh, as part of the FTA, but the Indigenous chapter. And in that uh, in Indigenous chapter, we're recognising a whole lot of things that had not been 
recognised in the same way before. So it is trendsetting for the whole world to have an Indigenous chapter in a free trade agreement. And that's pretty exciting, but not surprising, really, if we think about Te Tiriti and the relationship between the British people and Māori. And so it's, it's almost absolutely logical that we're doing that. And in that Indigenous chapter, uh, you, you know, we're talking about services, digital, data, culture, intellectual property, all those things that we as Māori hold dear to our hearts and value. And now it's fully expressed within a chapter. Um, so that's hugely exciting, as well as the fact, and Stephen, you had mentioned it, and Damien did as well, and thank you both, that Māori are, are very much primary producers. We are farmers. We are dairy farmers. We're beef and lamb farmers. Uh, we grow kiwi fruit. We're involved in fishery, forestry. We certainly expert, export, sorry, and, and are involved in tourism. So, you know, it is exciting that our borders are loosening up and, and there is opportunities for our young people, A, to get work in Aotearoa New Zealand, but also to be able to travel. Um, I know I have my mukapuna who, you know, had to do that trip to London to learn about the world. And that this free trade agreement supports that type of behaviour and that opportunity is just exciting for us. Um, and I just want to say the fact that I understand we're probably saving about $37 million a year on the benefits of having this free trade agreement for our exporters is huge and important in the Māori economy and important for the membership of the Federation of Māori Authorities because our Ahu Whenua Trusts financially support our members with dividends and this is really good for our business and we're pretty excited about that. Um, I'd just like to say hello to you, Laura, <laughs> having travelled to London with you and back again and, um, and know very well, as well as gin, you quite like Martin Borough wine. <laughs> and so, um, Philip, you will understand completely. <laughs> so it's um, really lovely to be here and happy to take questions, Stephen, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, kia ora, Liz. Thank you very much um, uh, for those insights. Let's, let's turn to um, Philip Grian now, uh, who will um, offer his assessment of this FDA. Kia ora. Kia ora, Stephen. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, just before I start talking about uh, wine, I, I really want to uh, endorse the, the comments of the High Commissioner, Laura, about around the importance of liberal democracies working together <clears throat> in a rules-based system and uh, the, uh, the horror that's going on in Ukraine uh, in the moment. Um, so I think it's really important. Look, uh, from a, a wine perspective, um, uh, New Ze as you noted before, Stephen, uh, uh, New Zealand wine is uh, New Zealand's biggest product that is sold in the UK. Um, the interesting thing about that is our market in the UK, uh, which is now worth sort of 450 million a year, developed after um, the UK joined the uh, join what was the common market, the EU. And um, the UK was the, was the market where New Zealand first developed its reputation for producing um, high quality wine. And so it's a, um, it's a market that um, there's a great deal of affection for uh, amongst New Zealand winemakers because the, the British recognised that we could do something pretty special before anybody else. Um, so uh, we like that. Look, the, with um, when we the government, the two governments started talking about a free trade agreement, we were we were 
very excited about the about the opportunity uh, because we we believe from a wine perspective um, we could do something pretty special uh, with the UK. Our view was uh, the UK had a great global trading ambition. Um, they had a uh, significant spirit sector, which you know, everybody's heard of Scott, uh, London Gin, et cetera. Uh, but they've also got a growing wine sector as well, uh, particularly sparkling wine. Um, and uh, our view was that any free trader agreement, there's got to be wins on both sides. You know, it has to be a win-win situation. Um, and that's the way we approach the agreement from a, from a New Zealand wine perspective. And look, we're absolutely delighted uh, at the outcome uh, because we believe it is, it really does reflect a, a modern, high quality uh, uh, approach to global wine trade. The agreement gets rid of some certification procedures which were just costing and adding nothing. They get rid of um, the tariffs, which were never big into the UK, but which were there and they're nice to have. Um, the ag agreement gives us much more flexibility around our winemaking practices. And that's one of the key things that we were uh, interested in is the EU has a very prescriptive set of winemaking rules and we wanted to get rid of some of those, uh, that some of that prescriptiveness and really uh, have a modern approach to winemaking. And uh, that's, what, that's what this agreement, this agreement does. You know, from our winemaking, from our winemakers' perspective, I think this is a huge signal that UK is open for business. It's open for business in a term, in, in a sense that um, um, modern business understands and and can deal with, and I think that's uh, really important. And we look forward to welcoming um, British sparkling wine in, in, into New Zealand, and I look forward to sharing a glass with the High Commissioner at some stage in the future. So, look, I, I just think it's a really good deal. And it's, uh, I think, it, as uh, Laura said before, it shows what um, liberal democracies with a, 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 a shared agenda can actually achieve. And I think that's uh, pretty exciting. Thanks. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, we all look forward to uh, even greater exchanges of wine and gin and other things in both directions. It's going to be a wonderful old time. Uh, let's turn to Nick now. Uh, Nick is living proof that to be a New Zealand Trade Commissioner, you have to get up early in the morning uh, and um, no stone left unturned in opening up those um, uh, opportunities for New Zealand exporters. So Nick, can you share your perspective, please? Uh, ena mana, ena reo. And thank you, Stephen. Um, it is an earlier start than I'm normally used to, um, but it's a pleasure to be here on this panel um, with my panelists and, um, and thank you to all of those joining the webinar. Uh, for those not familiar, the role of New Zealand Trade and Enterprise or Te Tōrapa Tūhono or NZTE um, is to grow New Zealand businesses internationally for the good of New Zealand. Uh, we support exporters by providing knowledge and connections in international markets like the UK to accelerate exporters' growth and help them to succeed in the long term. Um, the NZT London team, we currently work with about 120 businesses on a, uh, targeting the UK on an intensive basis, um, and we support hundreds more on a, on a more transactional basis. Um, and th this FTA is an exceptional opportunity to accelerate that work, uh, to guide businesses through the door that, that it opens, because it's only good for New Zealand if businesses make the most of it. Um, and it's our role to support Kiwi businesses to make this happen. Um, as will be apparent from um, what you've heard in this webinar, um, this is a complicated time for trade globally. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uncertainty and volatility um, and exporters are facing ongoing disruptions with global supply chains. Um, as we've heard that the Russian invasion of the Ukraine is an obvious and very real concern that feeds into that. Um, and as something of a consequence, I'm, I'm sure this is a familiar story in New Zealand, um, uh, inflation in the UK um, is at 5.5% uh, to CPI in January, so it's a 30-year high here, um, and some forecasts have that suggesting um, that it might reach 8% by the end of April. Um, and of course, it's the flow-on effects from that into higher interest rates and energy prices and the like. Um, the UK continues to adapt to the post 
Brexit trade environment. Um, there's changes to uh, the way that trade is done between the UK and the EU continue to come into effect. And then on top of that, there's the ongoing challenge um, from COVID-19. The UK recently lifted the last remaining COVID restrictions. Um, so it, 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 within London, day-to-day um, -day life has returned to a great extent. Um, but it's important to point out that all these things have, have brought about some, um, uh, some structural changes within uh, the economy here that I think um, will become entrenched. Uh, for example, um, the face of retail has changed for good here. In the first half of um, 2021 alone, 8,700 British high street stores closed, um, which was down from over 10,000 closures in the previous six months. However, um, in the same period, retail sales were up um, sorry, retail sales are now up to 3.6% of, of the pre-pandemic levels. Um, so the obvious uh, equation there is consumers are moving online um, and the role of NZT is to support companies to do that. Um, and the UK's GDP has returned to pre-pandemic levels um, or had returned rather before the Omicron wave hit in early December. Um, this is across all sectors and it's important to remember that the UK is an extremely strong underlying economy, um, and there is definitely optimism um, for recovery on the other side of this uncertainty. Uh, the UK continues to be an attractive market for New Zealand goods and services. Um, as, as I think we've heard, it's our seventh largest trading partner and six billion um, in two-way trade. Um, and it's a sophisticated and high income market um, with consumers are looking for quality, premium and unique offerings. Um, and in recent years, the number of New Zealand businesses um, that NZTs work with in this space has almost doubled. Um, so that demand is really there. Um, and there are consumers who are wanting our products. Um, and reducing barriers to trade between our two countries will increase choice and value for both the UK and New Zealand consumers. Um, so it does go both ways. Um, but from an NZT perspective, we are confident we'll see a wide range of New Zealand products and services um, more available in the UK. Um, New Zealand companies traditionally done well supplying high quality counter seasonal food and beverage to um, the British consumers for over 150 years. Um, and, and recently we've seen this develop into more innovative products. Um, just to give you some examples, um, Karma Cola is uh, exceptionally big here. Um, the Collective Dairy is doing extremely well. Um, and um, the carbon positive range of skincare from um, Emma Lewisham as well as um, is, is um, launched ex exceedingly well into the market. Um, we're seeing a host of other su uh, sectors succeed too, with Kiwis providing highly competitive software and technology solutions into what is arguably the services capital of the world, as well as solutions that take the best of New Zealand's agri technology to support productivity and efficiency on British farms. Um, continuing this story of success with the tailwind of the FTA, I see ongoing potential for future um, growth for Kiwi companies over here, and we expect to be working with a lot more companies um, uh, in the next couple of years. So the FTA prioritises tariff elimination, which will allow New Zealand exporters to improve price competitiveness. Um, NZT uh, expect businesses with these products will be considering the UK um, as a future market for growth. Digital trade and technology plays a critical role in overcoming the challenges of small scale and distance from markets, particularly in small to medium enterprises. Um, uh, for women and, and, and rural communities, um, and in this case, as we've heard from um, Liz uh, from Māori. Um, the tech sector has thrived in recent years for innovative Kiwi businesses over here. Um, globally, tech exports for New Zealand have reached 8.6 um, billion last year. Um, and digital exports are growing 23% between 2020 and 2021. Uh, and just to, to give an example of that, last week I spent some time with a Kiwi tech company here that's grown its presence from two to 27 employees in the last 18 months, despite all the lockdowns. Um, so the benefits um, that, that will be reaped from this um, uh, FTA are apparent. Um, and with a company like that, you, you know, the de development jobs are in New Zealand and the export earnings are heading home. Um, so this is an opportunity for New Zealand companies to enter the market or to gain ground um, on an equal footing in the UK. We urge exporters to think and plan uh, about how they will want to leverage the opportunities in front of them uh, and to consider early where the FTA will touch their supply and value chains.
Uh, we encourage businesses to think broadly about the value they can capture from the business in the long run, um, not as a one-off, um, and what relationships they can build that will benefit uh, your business for years to come, um, and to own and drive that strategy in the UK. Um, and really, the only challenge we have in the way at the moment is the clock. Um, so there is a information online about the FTA, obviously. Um, and if you have any questions and want to talk about your future strategy for the UK, then please do reach out to NZT to get that conversation started. That's what we're here for. Um, and the value to New Zealand for any agreement uh, like this only comes when businesses take up that opportunity. So we warmly encourage you to do that. Um, we're here to offer information and support and help um, make the most of, uh, of the UK market for your business. So thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, just got one question that's popped through um, that we, you could perhaps clarify um, straight away. Um, and the question is that if a, if a Maori business has support from NZTE uh, for a certain country already, would it be able to get the same sort of support uh, for uh, uh, in the UK? I mean, there are rules about the numbers of, of, of support you know, packages you can get. Yeah. Happy to answer. Um, yes, is the answer. We have a dedicated model business team, um, and I'm sure the person who posed the question is familiar with um, um, who they're working with within NZT on that. Um, and so I encourage them to reach out to that person um, and um, and seek the support that, um, that they are after. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, so look, uh, the, we've heard from the panel, and I just want to engage the panel in a little bit more of a discussion in the in the time we have left, which is actually not that great, but um, let's see what we can manage uh, while we are here. Um, and I want to ask a question about sustainability, because sustainability is at the heart of this agreement. Uh, you know, in, and we know that because the agreement has new provisions around trade and the environment. It has, a, it has much more overt reference uh, to climate change uh, and sustainability is important for all our businesses. But um, Laura Clark, I wanted to perhaps ask you first, um, uh, you know, um, what's the significance of these sustainability provisions from the British point of view? Uh, thank you. Well, I suppose uh, the first thing to say is we, we signed this FTA during the UK's COP26 presidency. Um, as we all know, we are um, living in what is an absolutely critical and decisive decade for the future of our planet. You know, we have got until 2030 to halve our emissions. Um, to keep 1.5 degrees alive and avoid catastrophic change uh, to our planet and all life on it. And so, you know, I think for us, that means for the UK government as a whole, that means that the environment and climate change is our top international priority. And if it's your top international priority, you need to use all the different levers you can find to try and achieve that aim. And it makes absolute sense. And, you know, it's baby steps, right? Um, we haven't cracked it yet on the trade front, but it's baby steps in terms of saying actually trade can also be a tool in achieving those environmental objectives. So what we've got um, in this agreement, it you know, removes tariffs on environmental goods. It sets out a list of environmental goods um, you know, to sort of try and encourage people to think about that. Um, it reaffirms our commitment to the Paris Agreement. It reaffirms our right to regulate so that nothing in the FTA can um, undermine our ability to take action on climate change within our countries. And I think, you know, there's, there's more there and there are other environmental standards as well. I think importantly also, um, there's the, it references, uh, you know, the concept of kaitiakitanga, the importance attached by Māori in, in looking after the environment. So there's a nice linkage in a way between the Māori economic uh, cooperation chapter and, and, and the environment chapter. Um, and there's read across also, and New Zealand's really good at innovating in this space, on the agreement on climate change, uh, trade and sustainability. You know, it is important that we try to use our trade levers to achieve our environmental and sustainability goals. Mm, mm, kia ora. And thank you for referencing that link with the Māori Economic Cooperation chapter, because that gives me the opportunity to bring in Liz at this point. Obviously, kaitiakitanga, hugely important to Māori exporters uh, who, who have a different, in some ways, a sort of different vision about the way uh, 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 environmental responsibility and or well, not a different vision, maybe a particular vision uh, about the way environmental responsibility and business development need to go hand in hand. What's your view on that, Liz Mellish? Oh, kia ora, Stephen. Look, it's really clear, and Laura, I thank you for, for raising that matter. Because one of the things, or, or, or the clear 
expression that Māori business use is that we operate on a quadruple bottom line in all our decision making. So not only do we hit economic targets for our people, but we also hit environmental, cultural and social targets. And if we can't front up at an AGM what, and, and explain to our owners and members what we're doing, we've somewhat failed as business people. And so we're and always are very clear about working in a sustainable manner. And you can see in Hewaki Eki Noa and the opportunities that are coming environmentally through RMA reforms and so on, that we're hugely involved and hugely developed in that kaitiaki tanga space. Um, and really what that means is it's, we have a responsibility to taking care of the environment in all its forms. And you know, our farmers are very particular about resting land. They're very particular about the Modi, the life force in the rivers and streams. And, and we've been practicing that for centuries. And we're really pleased that the world's catching up, actually. <laughs> so I hope that sort of explains it. it well for you but for us it's is inherent in everything that we do kia ora kia ora moto whakaro rangatira uh um philip gregan um sustainability is at the heart of the offer that uh goes alongside new zealand wines uh and um do you think that uh, this agreement can support uh the sort of marketing effort around new zealand's um you know offer proposition in the uk market from an environmental point of view? Uh, I think the short answer is yes, uh, Stephen. Uh, we've had a, a sustainability program since 1995, and, and why did we put that in place? Well, you know, two or three things, market demand, um, you know, wanting to look after our land, do, do better. But I, I think this is just another one of those signals to producers that sustainability and uh, it's important and the fact that it's central to the future. This is just another one of those signals that says, yes, from a market perspective, that's true. And it's being reflected in regulation. It's being, you know, it's been signed on to by two governments here mm. who uh, have, you know, have signed, as we've said, a modern agreement. Mm. And the fact that sustainability is inherent in a modern agreement, well, that shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. And, and Nick, um, you know, from your perspective on the ground, working with New Zealand um, exporters, uh, you know, and, and with British firms wanting to make responsible just choices and decisions about uh, buying sustainable products, uh, do you think this agreement is going to feed into that sort of narrative? Uh, I definitely think it, it does, Stephen, but I also think that um, the New Zealand businesses need to keep an eye on regulation and where consumers are at in the UK in this space um, because it's progressing extremely quickly here. Um, I haven't had the benefit of being back to New Zealand in the last two years to, to, to quite understand where New Zealand's up to, um, but we are uh, seeing a lot of announcements um, in terms of companies wanting to make sure um, that their supply chains are um, sustainable um, and doing the right things. And so what we're seeing um, is the need for all companies in the UK to, to up their game in a lot of this space. Um, and so it's a really important um, market entry factor um, for any companies looking at the UK, but it's also one for companies established here to really have their plans in place around this. Um, and, you know, a really good example is um, the, um, the UK just... Uh, brought in um, some further regulation around green claims in the UK um, and what you can and cannot say, um, which ends up having a huge impact on, um, on how um, uh, New Zealand companies position their products in the market. Um, and it's also really, and in, in if you're looking at the high end of uh, thing with, a, with a sophisticated consumers, um, this is an absolute must have in terms of how products are um, you know, how New Zealand companies are sourcing their products um, and the type of story they're telling around it um, and the work they're doing to make sure that they have a positive impact. And I think when I was talking earlier, I mentioned um, Emma Lewisham, who I'd, um, one of the companies here I'd hold up as being 
um, a company that has really grasped this um, and really understands it um, and have brought out a carbon positive range. So I think, I believe all their um, uh, products are carbon positive here in the UK. And that's extremely important. Hmm. Th thanks for that, Nick. Um, uh, look, uh, everybody, I know that we're tipping over the uh, the four o'clock mark here in uh, in New Zealand, but I'm going to continue for a, a, a short period of time because we're having uh, quite a bit of fun here, and it really is uh, extremely valuable. So we'll just carry on uh, for another, you know, five or ten minutes or hour or so, um, but um, not quite that long. Uh, another five minutes or so uh, should get us across. And I want to turn now to how we can make the agreement work. Uh, because we've signed the seal and delivered it. Of course, it's going to have to be ratified and that process is underway, but it's got to be made to work. And Nick, you've talked to us already, and I'm going to start with you and I'm going to go back to Laura uh, right at the end. Um, um, we, we, we've um, talked a bit about the sort of services available from, from NZTE, but um, when we talk about making the benefits of this agreement available to a wider group of people, that really means um, small and medium-sized enterprises, Maori business, um, women entrepreneurs, you know, what can we do for those particular groups that are going to make a real difference here? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, so um, I think last time I checked, about 92% of the companies that NZT works with um, come, fall into the category of uh, an SME in, ter in, in, in the way that it's defined within this agreement. Um, New Zealand is a nation of SMEs um, in terms of the, our businesses. Um, and so we are here to support on, on, on that front and, and many of the companies, as I said before, we're working with are, are in that space. Um, so yes, I think you alluded to it earlier, Stephen, there'll be more of these in, in more detail um, as to how to take advantage of specific or, or understand specific parts of the agreement to take advantage of it. Um, and we will also be making sure that we um, make that content available online. Um, a plug for something called My NZTE, where you can um, go and uh, develop your export journey online um, uh, with NZTE. And, um, and, and information and support will be there around that. Um, yeah, so th this is what we're here to do. Um, we're excited about the opportunity. We're geared up for it. Um, and we look forward to supporting New Zealand companies to make the most of it. Great. Um, Philip, in the wine industry, you've got large companies, you've got small companies. Uh, what's going to make the difference for them uh, to, in, in the UK market? Oh, look, we are fielding a huge number of inquiries from our members, large, medium and small, I've got to say, Stephen, about uh, what this means, what are the practical issues, and most of all, of course, when does it come into force? Um, and we're providing... Um, the best advice we can around those winemaking practices and those those sorts of uh, things. I think um, that uh, presuming the agreement comes into force it's sometime later this year, um, the and with New Zealanders increasingly travelling, our message to uh, wineries is is going to be get into the market, get out there. This is a signal that uh, the NZ UK. Uh, business is on a new level, there's a new future here, and I think the most important message for it, for our uh, wine businesses is get over to the UK and get out there and wear out some shoe leather. Mm, great. And uh, Fire Liz, uh, uh, is that the message for Maori business as well? Uh, the, a question earlier came from the floor, um, you know, is there is there the opportunity for, you know, business delegation, Maori, others? Uh, that could be organised. What's your view? Oh, look, I'm very clear, and and our business operators right across the country and all of those industries would go. Can't wait to get on the road and and take a delegation. And I've actually talked to Laura about that, um, and we hoped it would be a lot sooner. But of course, you know, circumstances have certainly uh, not aided that. But we're absolutely desperate. I was um, with the chairman of Zespri and some kiwi fruit farmers only last week, and they're excited about selling kiwi fruit to Britain. Um, our honey producers, you know, that they're, they're going to immediately benefit from developing that. So they're ready, ready to rock and get over there. So um, taking a trade delegation, we'll be talking very soon about how we manage getting that overseas and talking with 
the likes of Damien, but also with Nanaya and saying, let us get over there, let's take some delegations. Um, and I feel quite sure that because of that absolutely special relationship that we have as Aotearoa New Zealand with Britain, um, that, the, that you know, this will happen almost as a forerunner for everybody else. And, and, and we intend to be there in force mm. uh, trading. It's the thing that gets us out of bed in the morning, Stephen. <laughs> oh, Kilda. Well, we need we need more people to be doing that. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Uh, um, fire, um, Laura. I want to leave the last word on this uh, to you. And 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 it's not just one way. Uh, we want British um, exporters, business people, investors, service providers coming this way uh, as well. We haven't been able to actually shrink the distance between us, or maybe slightly through this agreement, um, but we need to compensate for that. What's your thought on this? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we've as, as well as Nick's excellent team in London, of course, we've got this sort of mirror equivalent in Auckland of our trade promotion team at the Consulate General, um, who are going to be really gearing up to support uh, British businesses who are wanting to invest here and sort of navigate the opportunities of the FTA. I do think webinars like this are really useful and also getting out for in-person meetings around the country. So that's important. And of course, absolutely, it'd be great to get um, um, trade delegations uh, traveling again, um, you know, kanohi tiki to kanohi rather than lots of zooies, I think is really important. Um, so it'd be great to have a Maori, tra Maori trade delegation go across. I think the prime minister is planning uh, to go across to Europe and take trade delegations with her. We've got to build those, um, you know, connections as well so that we're absolutely taking advantage of it all. Mm. Kia ora, Laura, thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to bring this to a close now. Uh, and um, I do want to uh, thank all our um, participants, uh, all to, to all of you who, uh, who, who tuned in, who Zoomed in, uh, but to the panel members in particular who gave up their time and their perspectives, and of course to the minister who kicked us off so ably uh, early in the day. I mean, we've heard about the FTA in its context, its geopolitical context, its historical context, its economic context. We've heard it's a commercially meaningful agreement, the most commercially meaningful agreement, clearly since the China FDA uh, uh, was signed, uh, one that delivers immediate benefits to New Zealand export exporters. We've heard about the innovation that is built inside the agreement in its rules, in its ability to reach out to new audiences and to engage on new issues. Um, uh, some of those issues like sustainability, uh, uh, like inclusion, uh, are very close to the heart of, of many of us. Um, and, and, and we have reflected on the historic nature of this agreement, the sort of history turning or something uh, that um, uh, offers a whole new basis for expanding this agreement. So thank you once again uh, to you all. Uh, thank you to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, for organizing the event today. There will be further engagements of this type. There will be the opportunity to uh, to continue to engage with the ministry. Um, I hope that Nick Swallow gets a decent coffee uh, very, very soon. Uh, and I hope that uh, you keep him busy over there in the UK. Thank you all once again. Tēnē te minu koutou and all the very best. Kia ora. Thank you. <laughs>